Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Star Citizen Live Outer Space Interface, because I'm a sucker for the rhyming titles. I'm your host, Jared Huckabee, and if you've never seen Star Citizen Live before, well, it's a, about an, it's where we take about an hour out of the end of our week, and we chat with some of our many developers. We discuss their work, uh, their, their efforts on the project. Uh, sometimes we take questions from you, the Star Citizen community. Other times we watch them work as they develop something live in front of everybody. Uh, on this week's show, we have two members of our steamed UI team. Let's meet them now. Let's see which button is that there. There we go. Uh, we have got... UI director, Mr. Simon Bursey. Hello, nice to meet you, Jared. Again. And we've and, and, and we've got a principal UI a programmer, Mr. David Bone Gill. Hello, Jared. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Now we say you've heard me say bone several times because throughout the convers throughout the hour we're probably we're gonna end up slipping and referring to David as Bone because that's his nickname. And every time we have David on the sh on a show, which is not often, but every time we have him, it's always it lends to some confusion. So for all those people who aren't here at the beginning, like they're gonna jump in in five minutes, ten minutes, or the people who jump in thirty minutes into the show, if they're like, what's Bone? What are they talking about? You all in chat, you all help us out. You all help us out here and, and, and tell people who the heck we're talking about here. So they don't think there's just this third person missing on the camera. Now, before we get started on this week's show, uh, as we are wont to do, let's, let's take a few minutes and uh, find out who you are and what you do. Because uh, the way UI works and is developed in this project is perhaps maybe a little bit different. That comes from our uh, building blocks thing. It democratizes the process, and we'll get into that. Uh, but just so folks understand the kind of scope of work and stuff, sign, uh, actually, David, why don't we start with you? Uh, what is your role in Star Citizen and its UI development? Oh, okay. Well, I, my role is I'm primarily a programmer, um, but I'm like a I think people call it a systems architect, which is like a fancy name for uh, developing systems. And I've been developing the system for the UI for, for our game. Um, we had uh, like the system that in place, but it wasn't really very um, star citizen-y. Um, it didn't really meet Chris's standards or it didn't meet a lot of the goals that we're trying to do um, for this um, big project. So about three years ago, Chris was like, right, can you make us something that will get us to this position where we can make UI for all these different you um, all these different systems in the game and make it easier for the designers to make UI, make it easier for the programmers, like the gameplay programmers to present their stuff so we can make UIs for them, things like that. And also bring in all these different like new rendering techniques as well, because what we had before was kind of a very, what people would call a traditional UI, like, hey, the, here's the game, we just render something over the top, you know, here's mm -hmm. number of lives or something in, in how many bullets you've got. But our game's quite a lot different from that. And obviously it's uh, online, uh, a lot of the UI is in the world. So we're all looking at, um, the same screens in the world and stuff like that. So my job was to develop technology that would help help us solve a lot of those problems along the way. Um, a lot of them new problems that you don't really see in a lot of games. And some of them are just like big performance problems and big, um, there's just a lot of stuff in our game. So like trying to make it so good tools so we can make things as quickly as possible. Um, well, iterate as quickly as possible, I think so. Right. Uh, you, you said I, I made this. You used the past tense a few times, but yeah, this is these are still tasks that are ongoing. I, I mean, it's, oh, it's, absolutely, yes. <laughs> it's it's it's. I I I think it'll th this will come up as a uh, common thread throughout the show, and it's always important to remember that Star Citizen is still an alpha. Uh, it, it, it 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 the UI, the user interface, uh, all the aspects of this are still in development, and you know, and, and still a work in progress. So. So always keep that in your mind as we discuss these things. Simon, you are the UI director. Uh, what is the UI director? What, what, what's your day-to-day -day like? Uh, well, I, I kind of wear many hats, which I guess is a phrase that you hear sometimes. Um, I suppose the actual 
bit that ties the most to the title is is my job to to make sure that the the UI in Star Citizen it's all kind of pulling in the same direction. So we kind of have consistency between the different areas because it's it's a really big game. We've got lots of different teams working on the UI or bits of the UI. So we we have to make sure that it you know it feels like the same game essentially. So there's a certain amount of and have rules for how stuff should work associated with that. And also there's the, the visual side of things. So um, got to make sure that, I know, say what the active feature team is working on is similar to what the UI feature team is working on, so on across the company. So there's, there's, a, there's a, quite a lot of that. That's, that's the main part of the job. Um, I also help to run the UI feature team. So I do a little bit of team lead stuff there, just kind of doing the day-to-day, -day, making sure people are happy and everything's planned out and that kind of thing. And very rarely, one thing I like to do is do a bit of hands-on. So I like to get in there and do a bit of kind of technical stuff, build some UI, when you can. make it work. But uh, a lot of the time, it's it's talking to other people and organizing things and giving people feedback. Now, you said something interesting, and we're going to jump into that with our next question here. Uh, working with other teams, like the actor feature team, to make sure uh, the things that they've created are in line with other things. Um, unlike... Uh, I'm not going to speak for every single game in development, but unlike many other games out there, uh, the UI team does not build all of the UI in Star Citizen. Uh, we have created a system that democratizes that process and puts the power in the hands of system designers on the actor feature team, system designers on the EUPU feature team, you know, uh, 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 systems designers on the systemic services team, uh, stuff like that. We, we've put the power into the hands of designers and all these other teams to create uh, much or uh, most of their UI and then the UI team kind of comes in and and you know shapes, adjusts, you know conforms it to the to fit the uh, the, the greater Star Citizen experience, um, and that's all through building blocks. Uh, how has the building blocks technology developed in the last year? I mean, we haven't really di uh, do uh, dove deep into it since we had Zane on. I think that I think it was still ATV uh, back then. Uh, you know, talking about so how has it developed in the last year, and where would you like to see it go in the future? So I'll start. There's plenty of things that Bone could say on this, um, but I think the, the important thing from my side is that we've we've kind of we've rolled it out from something that the UI t you, the, this kind of the core UI team used to use, and and we were kind of working out how to use it as well. It's got to a point now where it's good enough for the rest of the team to use. So we kind of rolled it out to game designers across the company, some of the artists, and that kind of thing. Um, so it kind of makes our jobs easier, I suppose, because there's I know it's not just six people trying to get the UI done for the whole company. Now, those particular teams can take control and they can make their own kind of demos and functional versions of stuff. So that's, that's a really big thing that it's, it's brought to us. Um, Bones, I'm sure Bo could go a lot, a lot into the technical things that have changed over the past year as well. Mm, over the past year, um, I think the thing, well, the thing, the major thing that we've been working on like at the core tech level um, would be adding 3D, which um, <laughs> it's a big feature. And it's as soon as you jump from, you know, drawing some text and some images to, hey, I want to be able to draw models, I want to be able to draw um, characters, vehicles, and all these kind of things as part of the UI scene, um, That's that things get pretty complicated of that. So, um, we've been working on that um, best part of a year. Um, so that involves um, lighting for those models, how the materials look, do you do holograms? Um, how do they appear in the UI? Do they appear in a screen? Do they appear over a screen? Do they appear without a screen? And just sort of like, you know, if you can have um, hologram UIs of floating letters, and ships and stuff like that. So there's all kinds of like, exciting rendering tech that we've been involved in with that. Um, uh, uh, we've seen that develop. For, for the, I think the first thing we've seen it in is the inventory, which we should be seeing. Um, and that was really, really quite complicated. We have we show like 50 models at a time, and each of those individual models has 
its own scene, its own camera, it has three lights. Um, so there's just thousands and thousands of little objects we have to um, manage all the time. So that's, that's what we've been doing over the past year. So as a core technology group, we develop that stuff ready for the gameplay teams to use. So maybe I'm hoping that we're in a space that they start using it and then they, they'll develop their UIs and hopefully the players will get to see that in a couple of re-releases time after that because we're like right at the start of that chain. So it right. now is into a state that the gameplay teams start to use it and then they come back to me and say, hey, it's not quite working correctly yet. <laughs> and then I fix a few things and then uh, then they can start developing their features with those kind of things. Yeah, as well as the 3D actually, there's, there's um, we put a lot more time into sort of reusable pieces as well. So when, maybe when Bone did his talk before, I know Zane showed some restylable stuff, which was really cool, but the actual process to, to do that was, was pretty complicated. So if you wanted a button, you had to make it from a like a square object and put some text on and all that kind of thing. And we've we've got a system now which which means we can sort of package those things up. So if somebody wants a button, instead of having to build it from all the pieces, they can just drag a button into their scene and change the name on it. Um, so we've added quite a few bits like that. So it doesn't make a massive difference to what people see at the end of the process, but for like less technical people, um, game designers and artists, it's a lot easier for them to just kind of build a, a screen out of pieces. And yeah. also all those pieces are restylable as well. So for example, at the moment we've, we've just added a Crusader style to the game. So if someone's already set up a, a screen, we can just turn it to Crusader and it will change colors and some of the graphics will change and so on, which is, is kind of cool. Uh, you use the phrase less technical. It's, it, it always amuses me because I think there's a perception out there that exists, you know, in, in the world of, of game developers, that, that all game developers are also master technicians, you, you, you know, they've all got degrees in computer science, or they all understand, you know, they all understand the inner workings of, of, of everything. And the reality is that many of these, you know, people, you know, artists or whatever, they come from very specialized fields. And so, you know, building a tool set that uh, is user friendly for them, is 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 essential in this um that takes me to my next question you mentioned that building blocks has made it easier for you because because many of the uh basic fundamental ui elements are actually created by our uh system designers on these other teams and not the ui team uh and then you and then you mentioned having to support them like when they say oh this isn't working or or, or this feature isn't working you know quite doing what i wanted to do uh whereas it makes it easier for the creation has that has that workload switched to support <laughs> are you now just as busy supporting everybody how how often do you have to clean up after the mess of of uh of other teams you know oh, creating ui fair. that just doesn't work <laughs> Well, um, go on then, Bone. Well, I, I think clean clean up um, is probably um, a bit overdoing it, but uh, we definitely, I definitely get a lot of um, calls during like the release phase of saying, "Hey, I've I've made all this and it's not working quite how I expect it to." Now, is that because they've implemented it wrong, or is it because maybe my stuff's wrong, or our you know the core tech is wrong? Um, so trying to help them debug what, what, what's going on and find out what the problem is, I think that that's grown. Um, but that's a really good thing. I can only see that as like a really positive step because we get lots and lots of people contributing now and being a support role is, um, a lot easier than what we used to do, which was having a really compressed role at the end of the um, release cycle, which is, or well, the gameplay teams have finished their feature and just go, it just needs UI now. Can you just make the <laughs> UI for it? And you'd it have It just like, needs UI now. Uh, yeah, that, um, yeah that, that was really tricky because you had to really get, get involved in lots of other people's work and understand what they want, then design it and write the tech and the UI for it. And, the, and these will all be completely individual systems. You'd be working on vehicles one week, and then you'd be working on the mobile glass the next week, and then you'd be yeah. working on the front end. And that was really difficult. You'd, you'd get these jack of all trades, master of none, because we were like diving in and out. But they were all equally very important at the same time. 
Um, but now that that's spread out, I'm offering support is a lot easier because I'm supporting them in a role where I know the tech and I can uh, I can give advice about the stuff that's going on. Um, and I'm also can hopefully write tools to help them debug their own stuff as well. Yeah. One, one thing that's interesting is you'd like with UI on games, not UI, with AI on games, you get this thing called emergent behavior where the game starts doing stuff that you didn't expect. We almost have <laughs> a similar thing with the, the UI tool where it's not it's not yeah. AI that's doing it, but we'll we'll make it decide it to do a particular thing, then we hand it over to people to actually use and they come up with all these crazy ways of use, using it that we never expected. So they they're usually doing really cool stuff, but sometimes I suppose there's two sides to it. Sometimes we'll get something that works really well and then we'll look at the the file that's been made to construct it and it's like spaghetti there's just connections everywhere um so we sometimes go in and kind of tidy that up a bit and let them know here's another way you could do it that's going to be a bit more efficient that kind of thing and other times it's like there is no better way to do this so bone for example might go away and write a new a new system that does that thing that they want to do or, or do it in a better way so there's that's that's where a lot of the support lies as well recreate like, uh, the crazy emergent thing designers <laughs> Yeah. No, uh, we won't name any names here. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think another thing that we can demystify is the idea that emergent behavior only comes from our players. Uh, it, it's very. It, it's. I, I'm often. Uh, I often say that uh, development is not construction. It is exploration. It 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 it, it is a search for ideas and a, and a search for solutions. And oftentimes in game development. Through, through the course of trying to create one thing, you inadvertently create another thing and go, oh, well, that's interesting. Maybe we should do that on purpose. And that often, that happens quite a lot in game development. We, we won't tell you which ones are which. Uh, well, we don't keep a list. Uh, now we're going to get into our, our the, the question and answer period from the from the backers here in a minute. Uh, for those of you who are wondering why we spent this time, you know, talking about building blocks and 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 bringing everybody up to speed here, uh, it's because I, I want to preface this before we get into some of these answers. The UI folks, the UI team at Star Citizen, because we have this building blocks, because we've democratized the process and 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 allowed the system designers for all these various teams to create their core functionalities, a lot of the questions about core functionality don't actually apply to the UI team, whereas that you otherwise might think they do. Like, you know, can can this button control all this stuff and stuff? That's actually something for the system designers and those individual teams that you're asking. So uh, we did put the call out and and uh, and grab some answers from some of the other teams so we're not going to ignore all the all the very specific drill down questions but i just want you to keep in mind that when we talk about some of these more granular details these are actually the work of uh, the EUPU feature team or the vehicle feature team and stuff like that and and the and the UI team sits above them helping and assisting and you know conforming and all that stuff like this uh Starting with the the number one question, the, uh, like we we knew it. This the second I said, "Hey, you want to be on the show?" and he said, "Yeah." And I said, "I'll tell you what the number one question is going to be," and we were right. Uh, any updates whatsoever that you can give us on the updated in-game star map? Okay, so <laughs> it's progressing. Um, it's it's really big system. So what we want to do with it. And what we've designed in the background, which we're not showing anybody yet, um, is this really big system that kind of combines the radar, the star map, um, potentially some of the AR markers, and also the interior map. We think really that should be one thing, essentially. So uh, like Chris Roberts has always had this idea that he wants to be able to start from the radar and zoom out from that, and you can see the star map, and you can zoom out and see the you know, the galactic view, essentially. So we've, we've been writing around that idea. Um, so we've got this really massive designer ties all those all those systems together, um, which is pretty cool. Um, we started writing code systems to support that. So we've we've got. I mean, one thing that's tricky with it, there's all this data from all over the game. So we've got we've got the planets and stuff. We've got the radar data. We've got I know, even things like missiles. We've got to somehow tie that together in a way that we can put into one place. So we spent quite a lot of time working on the the, the tracking system for all that stuff. So that's all. It's all, it's all good now, and and we're kind of at the stage where we we want to start building the building the real thing. So uh, I mean the the challenge is 
spending the time to, to fit all that stuff together. So that's that's something that we, we've we been kind of ticking along in the background, but we're, we're going to start ramping up on that very soon, I think. Couldn't give you a release date, but uh, well, we're, we don't do we're, we're really keen to get it going, and uh, it's it's moving. Um, well, we are working. I, I, I literally was working on it this morning. So you really called me up, Jared. But <laughs> oh, yeah, um, list three things you did this morning. I'm just, I'm just messing. With you. <laughs> uh, so, so the the, the, the the star map, we run into this with many features. Uh, they're 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 inheritors of of things from other systems. The it, it, the star map is not something that we can build in isolation all by itself and then put out there and be like, this is your star map. That's not the thing we want to make. The thing that w the thing that we're envisioning, the thing that you just described is this thing that can inherit all kinds of data from radar, from scanning, from, you know, from, from, you know, personal markers like, like, like the service beacons and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's got to inherit all, be able to inherit all this data from those other systems. And while those other systems are still being worked on are still being, developed uh, folks who watch our public roadmap uh, notice a, a change to the uh, uh, FPS uh, scanning and radar uh, intended to come online in 316 uh, while those things are still changing it's hard to build this thing that's going to inherit all of these things and they're like oh well, we changed how it works I'm like but I just hooked into it I just I just hooked into how it used to be and you went and changed it so it's it's definitely this obviously work that can still be done you're, you're doing it right now but as far as uh, expectations of when and stuff like this it is it is directly dependent not just on your own workload but on the continued progress of all these other systems that it has to inherit information from um another follow-up question to the star map from the chat uh will the design of this new star map be similar to the arc star map that folks have on the website right now uh scl q and a's we don't aren't usually the visual shows we don't usually have things to show so uh I guess describe what, what what should we be expecting? Paint us a picture in our heads, I guess. Okay, so I think anyone who's seen the Arc Star Map will have a good idea of, I suppose, the general idea of where we want to take it because we we do all like that. It's uh, I don't know, it's it's easy to interact with. It's quite clear. You can I don't know you can navigate between different pieces of it easily, a lot more easily than what's in in game at the moment. So that's definitely inspiration for us. Um, so visually, it will be. I definitely wanted to try want us to try and push it a bit further than that. So try and get a bit more a bit more of that sci-fi movie feel to it. Um, and in terms of functionality, uh, because it's kind of your window on the world, I think what we need to do as well is is have a bit more of a sort of Google Maps, Apple Maps style navigation thing going on. So, for example, if you want to find a planet on the other side of the solar system, being able to search for it, maybe just uh, quite easily navigate to it from this central interface. I think all that sort of stuff is that is going to make it feel nice. And so we're, we're, we're looking to take inspiration from the best maps out there overall. I hear you. Uh, to answer uh, uh, Snakehawk's question, how about not implementing the 100th update on mining? Uh, because these are UI guys. They're not building the mining. The, the, the team who is doing the mining can continue to work on the mining while these guys work on their other stuff. It's not a either or a proposition that all the teams don't just work on all the features. Yeah, yeah, it's that's true. I mean, the, the main the main way that we support other teams at the moment, we it, we're kind of the, the start and the end of the process. So like Bones team makes the initial bits for people to make their feature from, I guess. And then um, UI team will sometimes lend support on the visual side as well. So like at the moment, we're working on some uh, refueling stuff. So you are EUPU have been working on that and they've made this system that works really well. They've done UI that is okay. It doesn't look great, um, but they, they're not a team full of like UI designers and artists. So what we'll do is pass some of the stuff over to our, our visual guys to kind of upgrade it and make it look cool and star citizen and then the end, end product is really good, but uh, yeah, in general, it's the code side that, that's involved with things like the the, the star map. So it's yeah, you know. yeah and, and and I I will say it, it's it's working. Those who have been following the project for a while, uh, uh, you know, you know uh, going back to 
2014, 2015, 2016 days might remember a, 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 a familiar refrain, which I'm sure, I hope it doesn't give you PTSD, but you know, we're waiting. It's like this feature is waiting on UI. This feature is waiting on UI. This feature is waiting on UI. That was such a common refrain back in those days because of what David just said uh, earlier about how it's like you'd get to the end of the feature, then it's like, okay, slap a UI on it. It's like it was very clear that UI being downstream of everything was not the solution for a project as broad as, as Star Citizen. So uh, uh, not to keep harping on the success of building blocks, but, you know, building blocks is having these these new uh, you know the refinements to process that you guys have made and the new tools that you've provided have definitely sped up uh, the process. That said, like any team on Star Citizen, any team working on any feature, there are only so many things we can work on at any given time. You have to prioritize and stuff like that. So not everything can be worked on all at once. The next question. It, um, go ahead. Sorry, I just, just to, uh, um, um, I, I was at this sort of um, point of that uh, when, when everyone was waiting for UI. And this is why Chris... Uh, and correctly, so sort of pivoted it, the team at that point says so like this, this, this isn't going to work. We can't develop because we want to grow how many features we're going to develop, and that's just unless we just magic out of thin air another twenty UI guys, it's just not going to grow. It just turns into this great big bottleneck. So that is why around twenty seventeen, I think it was, we did change the mechanism that we wanted to develop the UI and, and go wide and like spread it across a lot of these teams so we can, um, well, I want to say put the onus back on them because it's, it's also like when all, when all, yeah, any trouble comes in, it's not just developing it, it's like at release time, um, inevitably there's a, you know, there's a few problems with any given feature, but if you, if, if you have 10 features and each of them have a, a few UI bugs in them, and they all have to be done by one UI team. It becomes a real bottleneck. So it was really good to go go wide across the company, and each of each of those guys then get the ownership of their particular feature from start to finish, and not just go, it's done, just needs UI. We're just waiting on the UI guys. It's like you are the UI guys now, right? Right. <laughs> so, you know, bar bar some. Um, we deputize nice, uh, fancy graphics and animations from the uh, the. Uh, art design departments. We deputized a bunch of people on a bunch of different teams throughout the company. Congratulations. Um, from the live chat here, uh, moving on to another topic that's close to a lot of people's uh, performance heart. Uh, where was it? Mock Driver 22 says, how far are we from declaring Star Citizen completely flash free? Seven. <laughs> We have seven to go, or are we seven along? How does that work? What scale um, are you using, Bone? Oh, I'm not giving you the scale. I'm just giving you a number. <laughs> um, quite far, I'd say. I um, I don't want to. I can't give her like a, a an, an ac accurate number. We're definitely past halfway. Um, we've got the. We definitely got the process down. Like we know exactly how we're going to do it, and we've got designs for a lot of the things that we want to change over but uh, a lot of it is balancing new features i suppose with with going back to the old stuff and kind of porting it over because we one thing that we like to do and i think chris roberts likes to do this as well is when we touch an old feature we don't want to just take what was there and just put it in exactly the make same anything, yeah. we, we, we'll tend to work out what the problems were and, were and redesign little bits maybe make it visually better as well so it's, it's quite a quite an involved process to, to convert convert things over overall I think I think it's a really good opportunity to revisit because these are inevitably some of the older features across the game. So it gives you an opportunity to revisit them and say um, what's not great about these things, what would improve it. You know, would it would it look miles better with some three D models and stuff, or you know, uh, better animations? Or I mean, things like the inventory on the Moby Glass was just completely redesigned because. Um, it wasn't a favorite feature of ours at the time. So like, we looked at it and went, right, actually, if we're going to redo this, let's, let's rethink it in, in, a, in a more appropriate way. But certain other things are, are, if it ain't broke, you know, let's just make a neater version of this that we can manage and um, 
maintain a lot easier. Um, maintaining the old stuff has become quite difficult now. Um, like the knowledge base is <laughs> reducing of people that want to work on this stuff. <laughs> yeah, and also, also Flash isn't really supported anymore by Adobe. So yeah. the, the the longer we go from, I don't know, the further we get through time, the harder it is to to fix the Flash stuff. So so we definitely want to get that ported over when we can do. I think the major the major features that we, we want to do is um, there's a star map which we're working on, obviously. Bobo glass is a big thing. Um, the MFDs on chips and also the the visor, so the the, the lens and visor that the player looks through. Um, we want to update that and bring that into the modern day, I guess. You said Moby Glass. You uh -oh. said Moby Glass. Uh, our, 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 our biggest our biggest flash El Wapo. Uh, for those who have seen Three Amigos, uh, what what progress can you give us on the Moby Glass rework? So, um, at the moment, I mean, we've been focusing mainly on other things, so star map or the design and so on, and the the back end of the star map has been taking a lot of the focus, aside from just little bits and pieces of features here and there. Um, we're starting to ramp up a little bit on the Moby Glass now, so we're looking into some visual prototyping work. Um, what Chris Roberts wants to see, he wants to know, taking the new tech that we've got with all this 3D stuff and so on, what can we do to make the, make the Moby Glass feel cool, but still be usable? So the first stage of that is we're going to do some in-game prototyping and work out, I don't know, what, could, what can we do there? How, how cool can we make it look yet to still be usable? So there's a bit of investigation to do there. Um, and that's... It's going to take some iteration between ourselves and also Chris Roberts, the game directors and so on, until they're happy with, you know, this is what we want the Moby Glass to be. And then when that's signed off, then it's then we can actually start to, to make the thing. So I think, I don't know how difficult it's going to be, to be honest, because essentially we're like, it's like we're making a new operating system almost. We Once we've got that, that core in place, we know how it looks, how it works in 3D and so on. Then in theory, it's just a case of porting all the old apps across. So like take the mission manager and update it, update that visually and so on. So right. I think it's one of those things that once we've got over the initial hurdles, it'll start to speed up. But uh, I'm not giving you any dates. No, we don't, we don't do dates here. Uh, it, it, this is a good time to reiterate something you, 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 you dropped kind of casually early on. We don't just want to do conversions of these things from flash to you know, building blocks and what it's not just, just make the same thing. Like if you're going to spend, if you're going to spend, seven weeks i'm just pulling numbers out of the air guys if you're going to spend seven weeks converting this thing from flash to building blocks and it's the exact same thing why not take nine weeks and actually redesign it you know make it better improve upon it you know look at some of these features that backers have been asking for for so long some of these features that we've been asking for for so long uh and and take that effort to redo it and make it better at the time. So it does mean it takes a little bit longer than just converting it over, but, uh, you know, ultimately it's worth it in the end, or we hope it will be. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what we're aiming for is like, this is the version of the Moby glass, the final version of the Moby glass. So once it's done, then I know maybe we'll polish it a little bit in future, but essentially it's good. Uh, will you consider adding a version of snake to play on the Moby glass? That's a good question. It's I think a few people have uh, mentioned having games on there. So we don't have it in the plans at the moment, but it would be a cool idea. And I'm not I'm not against doing that let's one just, day. Let's, let's, there let's are really plenty decide. of other things to do in the game, I would say. <laughs> like plenty of other parts of game to get right before we consider mini games um, on the mobile games. Legal's actually in the other room. Toast! Does somebody own Snake? <laughs> He's not responding. Um, we'll, 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 I'll, I'll check in with I'll check in with him and see what we can <laughs> see if it's even legally uh, allowed. Um, let's move on to some other features. One of the most uh, requested things it, it's been popping up in chat That's a couple. A question. <laughs> Did you hear him? He just said it's a complicated question. He just yelled. That's you thought it was a answer. gag. He was really there. <laughs> I thought it was. A joke. Yeah, I. It's... That, that's usually my answer to any question that Simon gives me. It's like, can we do this? And I just go, it's complicated. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll just call it Caterpillar. We'll, we'll be all right. Um, all right. So um, 
Night vision. Oh, cat alert. Hold on. Hi, sorry. Hi, cat. <laughs> okay. We took our cat moment. Uh, night vision. A night vision is a, is, is, is a big one. Obviously, in space, it's always some version of night, I suppose. But... You know, as planets become a bigger uh, feature of Star Citizen, as more gameplay moves down to them, uh, the ability to see where you're going and not crash into a mountain becomes super important. We recently uh, uh, revamped Ping and gave it this brand new shader that this is really cool and kind of draws everything like this. Um, have there been any discussions uh, in, in, in any in any thoughts about implementing some version of night vision beyond just forcing people to put the ping on auto fire and just constantly oh, I don't know to be honest I mean to see where they're going it's definitely Good something idea. that we need to improve in some way but uh, there's not been not really been any discussions on the UI side for, for what we can change there I think it's probably it's probably more the kind of thing that the vehicle team and the axe feature team would look into to be honest because they once you can let people see in the dark, it's obviously got a load of gameplay implications. Like, I don't know, people can not hide anymore, or maybe we need to put ranges on things and that kind of thing. So there's, there's loads of gameplay implications to figure out. But um, yeah, so I don't know where that is up to. I wouldn't be surprised if there's if somebody's thinking about it right now, but uh, it's not really a UI team thing just now. Fair enough. Uh, let's see. Um, you guys couldn't see it, but the cat was absolutely assaulting David during uh, Simon's answer there. Uh, one of the one of the one of the it was actually a, a Halloween last year when we first showed off uh, the Aegis uh, manufacturer specific you know style guide uh, for the ship huds, um, and since then we haven't seen a lot of uh, forward facing uh, information about it. What can you tell us about uh, maybe not just the Aegis one, but any manufacturer based uh, ship huds? How's that going? So um, we've kind of one thing we decided to do was was do a little bit of a halfway house because initially we we had this we got this cool thing with, that we've been building I mean we've been trying to get it really good for Squadron Forty Two so that was the initial focus for the Aegis HUD and we felt that the amount of improvements that, that were going on there the PU was missing out so we we've done this kind of intermediate version at the moment which is what you can see I think that's since the previous release um, it doesn't look. It doesn't look final. It's not intended to look final. It looks kind of cool, but it's not not where we want to end up. Um, so we've got that version that has all the features in. It, we can do simple things like change the colors and fonts if you want to. Um, but in terms of rolling out the, the, the proper final HUDs, um, the way we want to do it is, is essentially get that initial Gladius HUD internally, get that 100% how we want it. So all the features on there. So we have missile mode, how we want it, bombs, how we want it, all the different lock-ons and that kind of thing. And we're getting pretty close now, I think. Um, but Chris Roberts basically wants to wait till wait till that's just right. And then we're going to decide how we're going to roll that out to the rest of the game. Um, while we've been developing that, it's it's not so difficult for us to do artwork as well. So we've, we've, we've started visual development on, on the Drake HUD as well as RSI. So those are ticking along in the background. Um, but when they'll get rolled out to everybody, I'm not totally sure yet. Okay. Yeah, we, 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 we've, we've shown folks some of the uh, early concepts for the Drake HUD. We haven't shown anything for the RSI HUD just yet. But yeah. when, one we thing do that we every week. It'll come. Yep. One thing we, 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 we've started to do is it's not the ship HUDs, um, but we started to roll out some manufacturer styles for the other screens in the ships. Right. So um, for... Crusader ships, for example, I think in 315, you'll mm -hmm. you'll see on some of those we've got some new door panels and we've got a style that we can apply to the elevators and so on. So um, that work is starting to creep in there, even if it's not in the hoods that you see right now. It even showed up on some ships that weren't Crusader in the PTU. <laughs> it's a work in progress. Um, Always fun. Are there any plans to bring back custom QT waypoints? Ooh, that is a good question. We had to ask the, uh, the vehicle guys. That's a VET guys, question, we? really. What did they say? Hang on. Where is that? Da, 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 da. David, what's the cat's name? Uh, that one's called Ronnie. That's the one that um, has been confused by the uh, chain, uh, the clock. The time changes, right. and she thinks it's 
an hour later than it is. So it's definitely tea time now, according to her. All right, I found the QT waypoint stuff. So I spoke to uh, John Crew, um, and he, he said that VET, they do have plans for quantum in future that it might not involve Q custom QT way waypoints, but it should give the same end result. So they're, they're prototyping some ideas at the moment, but uh, there's not a lot more they can tell right now. Okay. Uh, will the targeting UI get smarter than just red and white targets, such as color codes for team members, org members, faction members, uh, et cetera? Uh, this would really help during something like Ninetales. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's something that we're looking into right now. We, we've, we've, we have had feedback at, of expanding that system because obviously just having I know, good, bad, and in between is, is quite I know, simplistic. So um, we've been looking at some ex potentially adding some extra colors in there, some extra icons and so on. So you can I know, split out a lot more information from that. So it's we've been having those conversations this week, actually. So uh, the system will come online at some point and we have got plans for it. Um, it's, it's kind of at that phase now where we, as a designer, designers, we kind of know what we want to do with it. We need to get final sign off from all the like directors and so on. And then fairly soon that should, should start to make its way into the game, I think. Gotcha. Um, MFDs, uh, what technology blockers are preventing my ship from saving MFD status, such as which screens I choose to place on each MFD per ship? I'm going to guess that's probably just waiting for the new MFD system to be finished, right? Yeah, uh, this is this is more a matter of priority. So there's no technical blockers. It's it, once it's possible right now. It's just not not um, you. You wouldn't write it with the current system because we would want to. It would just be like wasted work. Um, so we're in the process of um, upgrading the way that the UI works on MFDs, and part of that upgrade will include much better customization and the much better customization will inevitably lead to wanting to be able to persist that customization from session to session or um, in different vehicles and stuff and so um, yeah that's part of that block of work that they're doing you know pretty much uh, is inbuilt into that task so technically no blocker but the blocker is a priority issue or more than anything else yeah. um in the chat here. Um, can we please have the old landing HUD back? Yes. Um, yes. At some point. <laughs> yeah, so um, we, we have got plans to, to bring this back at some point, yeah. Um, it ties in a little bit with what we want to do with the radar, because um, you know, you've got that spherical radar thing at the bottom. So mm -hmm. it, some of the functionality relates, relates to that. So it's part of that design to a degree. And we, yeah, it's definitely planned. Um, this, is a, this is a big one for a lot. Obviously, Star Citizens are maybe not the normal uh, a batch. They're not all running 16 by 9, you know, 1920 by 1080 screens uh, by any means. Uh, are there any plans to improve the UI so it better fits non-standard aspect ratios like ultra, ultra, ultra wide screens? Yeah, I can, I can see. Bone, how, how you doing? So what do you think about this, Bone? Um, yes. I, 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 so there's a one-word answer to this, which is yes. And then I could go all night about what we're doing to improve this. Um, give, give, give us the 10 cent version. Right. So aspect ratios are the thing that gives most UI designers, UI engineers, like the absolute fear. Um, it's just bane of our lives. Um, but I totally appreciate that, especially on PC games as well, that like people have some cool setups of like uh, 32 by 9 and 48 by 9, but also some strange people have 4 by 3 aspect ratio screens and things like this. So or at least you can run it in a window that is 4.3 and all these kind of things. So yes, we have to build in a lot of tech to deal with this. Um, so we have stuff that's kind of like when you resize your window on a, um, a web browser or something and you see you know all the text jiggles around and it aligns itself properly all being well if it's designed correctly so it's all flexible like that so the system is 
designed to be flexible. The coordinate system can change with the aspect ratio. So, um, you know, you don't see stretch things and things like that. Um, so that like at a core level, yes, it's inbuilt, but then um, there's a design level that all the assets have to be designed in a way that can be flexible. Um, so that's pretty tricky because you have to make lots of choices about, you know, well, if it gets all squished up, do all these things go along the bottom or, or do they get clipped off at the end or do they shrink down and all these kind of decisions that have to be made by each for each individual design. And then we've got individual like responses for things. So things like the front end, we've just pretty much gone with a 16 by nine aspect ratio and we just black bar the wider screens and uh, or black bar the top and bottom if you're on a on a squarer screen. Um, and that that's it's a bit of a cop out for that screen, but it's nice because you you just you can design a nice looking 16 by nine layout for the whole front end. Where it gets a bit more tricky is things like the lens and visor, because that's, that's obviously a lot more sort of emergent. And then we still have to make a lot of decisions about this where, um, I mean, the tech supports this, but it's just about making design decisions. Let's say you've got like um, different icons in the top left and top right hand corner. If you have three monitors, do you want those into the top left and right corners of those three monitors, because that's not really in your eye line. You're going, oh, how, where's my map or how many bullets do I have or whatever it is. And you sort of, it's three, having three monitors is a bit more about having a lot of peripheral vision. It's not about like moving all the way out, all the UI out, the way out, all the way out. Um, so there's a lot of design decisions that go along the lines of that. So yes, we're working on that also. Uh, and finally, um, one of the bigger problems of, well, one of the bigger challenges, sorry, of a Star Citizen is it's diegetic. So uh, that means like all this UI is actually in world on physical objects. So we've got um, maybe a 16 by nine panel or even the Moby Glass is actually a 16 by nine panel that you're holding in front of you like this. So that comes with challenges of saying, well, if I've got a very square monitor and I'm trying to look at this, wider aspect ratio screen where do you position your camera i mean there's only so far you can move your arm back in the head back right. to try and see see this uh oblong thing in a square square hole um same goes for using the kiosks um do you just get a lot more peripheral vision do you have to move the camera back does the guy have to stand further away we're having to make like decisions to make it be logically correct and fit in to the universe properly we're not like just um we don't we don't cheat in, in any point for these things but it becomes really tricky um we are really designing the visor too because currently the visor is it's actually a physically a physical piece of geometry a piece of glass with ui on it and it sort of sits in front of the camera like this so as you move the camera around it goes with the camera but that inherently has problems of well it's 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 a piece of glass at 60 million aspect ratio. So what, what do you want to do if you want to draw things outside of that piece of glass? It was sort of restricted. Um, so we're redesigning that and coming up with different solutions to that to make that work properly. But on the whole, yes, we're working on it, but um, it makes me cry on quite a regular basis. <laughs> hey, it, the desire for a diegetic world in a reality of differing aspect ratios i mean uh, i mean I, I i i when i move the game over to my vertical monitor on the right here i mean it's just garbage it, it, there's no support for my vertical alignment at all just put that out there just um the raises a ticket with that <laughs> yeah we'll put it on the backlog uh will we at some point be able to change the color of our huds Light blue HUD over a snowy white planet and moon can be kind of hard to make out. This is there's kind of two bits to this, I suppose. There's the there's the legibility thing, like how easy is it how easy is it to read, and then there's the customization thing. So um, in terms of legibility, we're we're always looking into better ways to do that. So we, we have a thing at the moment where it it automatically makes the screen a bit brighter and and increases the drop shadow on 
bright backgrounds. So that's that's a little step in the right direction. But we're always looking to at ways we can improve that. So ideally, we want to get it to a point where players wouldn't need to change the colors to be able to see the stuff. Um, I think we're, we're, we're getting there. And then in terms of customization, the direction at the moment is we want to we want to kind of make each manufacturer feel unique. So especially starting with the ships, we want people to be able to say, OK, my, my Drake ship looks like this with these particular colors, and my RSI ship looks this way. Um, so we're definitely heading more towards that direction at the moment. Um, Technology-wise, it is it would be possible for us to allow things to be customized, but I think that's something that we'd look at look at after we've got the I don't know the vision, the ideal vision in in place first. What, what, yeah, what if did. we? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. Um, no, just to reiterate what Simon's saying that um, ideally we wouldn't. It wouldn't be an issue that you'd want to change the colors if if the legibility was, you know. Uh, perfect across all these different environments. Again, it's the same uh, story with uh, it being diegetic that uh, the visor and the lens and the uh, head up displays are actually in world. So the, um, the same effects are applied to them that are applied to real pieces of glass in world. So you know, the, the exposure is different and what's behind them, we can't really control. We can't control if they're looking at the sun or the blackness of space. So there's automatic exposure control to change a bit like you get on a on a smartphone. It brightens up in in bright environment, darkens down. It's obviously more complex because it's translucent. Um, so in an ideal world, we would fix all the problems so people wouldn't have to or feel like it was a like a requirement and that w i don't think it would work long term anyway because like you're you're flying on somewhere that's snowy for instance and you decide to pick colors that would look good against the snow and then you suddenly fly into space and then it doesn't look good it's mm. it's not really a solution that you have to keep <laughs> configuring your colors to to be able to read the ui really the ui should be adapting to the environment properly and hopefully we'll solve that or at least get it dialed in a lot better i i wonder i wonder if if if, if, if maybe it's i mean you can look uh trying to think how to, how to how to say this i wonder if maybe even just a single button light dark mode toggle might just help folks you know you know if it's just you know put it in their control like you know it's light mode when they're flying everywhere else and then when they happen to be facing the sun or they happen or, or they or they go down to the service of microtech they can hit one button and just switch it to to a night mode which is which is a darker you know theme so i wonder if something like that might just resolve a lot of these issues in the meantime but yeah i would definitely consider. well we've definitely talked about it for um, uh, visually impaired people as well anyway um to because certain uh, colors are not as easy to um, uh, decipher. So the the will we have talked quite a lot about how we can customize this, and make it a lot more um, approachable for different different people to use. Um, let's see. We've only got we've only got a couple minutes left. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the big features coming along in Alpha 316 is refueling. Uh, we're going to talk about refueling on ISC in a couple weeks, but uh, as far as the UI, the interface, and, and stuff like that, uh, what, what what's your guys' involvement been in uh, refueling up to this point? Okay, well, re refueling is a good one actually. It's going really well. So um, when we started out, there was I mean, we, we began with a game. There was a game design doc that. Uh, EUPU made, which was pretty cool. And then initially we had some, I had some conversations with those guys. We just roughed out some really basic ideas for the UI. So like I would just draw some boxes and put text on. So they, they had an idea of a very vague direction where I would take it. And then we kind of left it with them for a bit. And they've been implementing the actual system. And then using the building block stuff, they've put in this kind of placeholder UI. So it's all working and it's good. It just looks a bit rough around the edges. And then I think I mentioned it before, we've, we've now kind of, we haven't, we haven't taken it off them. We're working really closely with them to kind of take that and make it good. So process says we've got uh, one, of the guy, one of the guys is 
he's kind of a mixture between a graphic designer and a UI designer. So he's basically, he's taken those initial screens and rejigged the layout a little bit and resized things and also applied this nice color scheme and little graphical elements on there. So he's, he's going to made these visual versions that are 2D. They're just kind of in Photoshop or whatever. Mm. And then on the other hand, we've got one of our technical UI designers who's taking those concepts and kind of marrying them up with the stuff that you the UPU have created, so kind of actually implementing it in building blocks. So that's kind of that's the ideal process, and it seems to be working really well just now. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with that. And I guess everyone will get to see it quite soon. Yeah, folks will get the first look at refueling in a couple weeks, sometime after IAE. Uh, and when we do show it, remember, like all things, it'll be still be work in progress when you see it. Uh, uh, just important to remember that everything you see on ISC is work in progress. We put it down in the corner, but sometimes folks still like, what does it look like? No, no, it, it's work in progress. Just look at the bombs. Remember how the bombs looked in, 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 in ISC? And they're like, oh, the bombs are a little overwhelming. And then you get into PTU, and it's like, oh, wow. And you're like, you can see them from miles away. It's like work in progress. We waited to the last show of the season. We waited as long as we could to get those great bomb visuals in. And sometimes you just... It's just not ready in time, so it's work in progress. Remember, it's always work in progress. I would tattoo that somewhere if I could. Um, chat. Here's another big one. Will in-game chat uh, get an overhaul for display that will allow us to display multiple chat tabs with different colors, maybe, all in the same feed? Chat customization. Yeah, it's a good question. It's, chat is one of those things that we need to port over at some point soon um we've not really looked into what we want to change design wise i'm sure there'll be things like that that we want to sort of polish up um but uh yeah it's on our, it's on our to-do list basically so when we when we get to it we'll check out what's there we'll see what the competition are doing like there's a lot of other games out there that do a good job of chat and we'll work out you know what actually we want to put into it and then hopefully what you get out of the other end is is great but uh, we haven't quite got to the point where we're working on that yet. And maybe for some of us, the option to just default it to turned off. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, another big, uh, an another big question that comes up quite often. We've, we, uh, this is probably something along with like the star map work. Um, overall, what's involved in the creation of a coordinate system? Uh, obviously, we have service beacons and stuff now, but it can be very difficult to determine where you are on a planet or in space and easily tell other people where you are. It's like this. Um, what, 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 what's involved in that kind of work? Is this something that we're ever going to have? Is this something that we can't have? Is this something that's in progress? What can you tell us? So, well, um, I guess in the way that games are made in 3D graphics as well, you generally have this like XYZ coordinate system, which it's fine. Like if, if, you, if you want to see where this pen is in my room, I can say it's like three, I don't know, three across and two up, whatever, which is fine. But then when you're in space, or actually imagine you're on a moon that's, that's rotating, that's orbiting around a planet, which is orbiting around the sun. So those you know, X, Y, Z coordinates aren't going to work. So what we think we need to do is have like a system that relates to what you are on. So if I'm on that moon, I want to know, I know, What's my angle relative to the center of the moon and how far out am I from that? So we'll probably go with something along those lines. In terms of putting into the game, it's going to tie in quite closely with uh, the new star map and radar. So we, we definitely do want to have that in there when we release a new version of those. So minimum will sh display where you are so people can say, oh, I'm at this, this, and this relative to the Stanton system, for example. Um, what we would like to do ideally is have some way of sharing those those details. So maybe you can right click and send the location to, to one of your friends or that kind of thing. Um, we still need to work out the details on that, but we definitely want to improve that that whole area overall. That's cool. Uh, folks, you've done it. Your hour is done. Did it go by faster than I said it? Like I said it would. It was pretty quick. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's always like, oh, how are we going to fill up a whole hour? And then at the end, they're like, oh, that went by really fast. Uh, thank you guys for taking the time to uh, uh, show up on the show uh, uh, this week. Uh, we don't get to have you on very often uh, simply because 
the UI team is probably the one team in the entire company that touches every single aspect of Star Citizen's development. There is no aspect of Star Citizen that doesn't involve UI in one way, shape, or form. So they, they, these, these folks usually have their, their hands pretty full. So thank you for taking the time to join us here at the end of this week. Uh, that's it for Star Citizen Live Outer Space Interface. Uh, come back next week. Next week on ISC, we have a show entirely dedicated to uh, the future of space combat uh, with the vehicle experience team. Uh, they, they got a whole nice little presentation about uh, uh, the current work, their, the, the work of their immediate future, and then uh, some look at some long-term stuff. Uh, it's a great lead-in before IAE starts the next week before. And then uh, next Friday when we come back here, uh, we're going to have a, a, a super uh, a, a rare guest, um, uh, well, you have to tune in to find out. It, it, it's somebody who's made a lot of spaceships for us. It's somebody who's made more spaceships than anybody in the history of our game. It's Mr. Gavin Rothery, uh, concept artist extraordinaire and film director and all kinds of stuff. So we're going to have him on the show and talk a bit about his uh, career and, and, and life and work on Star Citizen. So check that out next week. Uh, for Star Citizen Live, I'm Jared. That was Simon. That was David Bone Gill. I think we made Thank it through you. without calling you Bone a bunch of times. Uh, take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. Cheers. Bye. See, I told you that'd be easy. It's easy when you know what you're talking about. <laughs>